welcome to the British Library. Please sit down quickly. We've got people joining us online, so I don't want to keep them waiting. Um, welcome again to the British Library. It is the home of words and people who love them. My name's B. Rolat. I work in the cultural events team. We get up to all sorts of brilliant stuff. You should definitely be on our mailing list. Now, people come to the British Library for knowledge, they come for inspiration. They come to examine concepts like the public good. Um, some of them come here for raw, unbridled intellectual energy. Now, tonight, you're going to get all of those things in spades. So, trust me, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event around the big con and beyond the big con with Mariana Rosie and in the capable hands of Gillian Tett, the super reassuringly brilliant author and journalist and superstar of the Financial Times and provost of King's College, Cambridge. So I would like you now to join me in a huge applause to welcome to the stage. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed for that fantas fantastic introduction. And it's great to see so many of you here tonight and also to know that lots of you are watching online as well. Um, just to kick off, let me get a sense of who you actually are in the audience. Hands up those of you who are Mariana's students. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, or those of, those of you who want to admit it. Okay, hands up those of you who are economists. Few. Or Mariana's children. <laughs> <laughs> Whole first row. <laughs> exactly. Well, they're all wannabe economists, I'm sure not. Um, hands up who are civil servants. And hands up any management consultants. <laughs> and actually, there are a lot of them. They're sort of sitting together. Bring them to together the front row. Safety. Come to so, the front row. <laughs> that's great. Well, we're going to have plenty of chance to provide some really thought-provoking material for all of you. Um, I should say that, as you just heard, I've been a financial journalist now for about 30 years. And when I started out at the FT, um, I kind of assumed that economists were all dusty middle-aged men <laughs> who mostly sat in universities and weren't terribly excited about the idea of talking to people like me. And then along came Mariana, who has become something of a female economics rock star because not only has she done a lot of very important academic work, but she's really challenged governments, policymakers, journalists, and academics about what it means to be an active e e economist who's trying to influence policymaking. Um, coming from King's College, Cambridge, which was the home of John Maynard Keynes, mm -hmm. I know all about how that played out almost 100 years ago. But Mariana has picked up many of these scenes remarkably effectively um, from her perch now at UCL and tried to help us to rethink industrial policy, the common good, the public good, and the role of government in our everyday lives. So we're going to be talking tonight about the book that Rose. she... I'm going to, <laughs> just going to introduce her. About the book that she has co-authored with Rosie Collington, one of her PhD students, who is also a political economist, done a PhD looking at government policy and climate change and other issues around industrial policy. Um, and we're going to be talking about, in particular, your work looking at management consultants and how they interact with the government. You've previously written about industrial policy, your wonderful book about moonshots, really threw down the gauntlets to governments. Um, it made industrial policy fashionable before we even had people like the Biden administration talking about it. But this is really quite a different tack. So perhaps I can ask, start by asking you, why did you decide right now in history, or rather a, a year ago, because we're actually here to celebrate the publication of the paperback book, um, the hardback book came out a year ago, um, but I'm curious, why did you think that 2023 was the right moment to have a go at management consultants? <laughs> Good question. And uh, well, first of all, thank you so much, Gillian, for accepting to be our moderator. Gillian is one of the world's top journalists who comes to it from an anthropological perspective. So she actually looks at capitalism 
in a way that's much deeper, I think, than many uh, people, and I've learned so much from your work. It's also great to be here. So when I set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, where Rosie's doing her PhD, we launched our lecture series here at the British Library with Rolly Keating, the head, precisely because of its role uh, alongside the BBC, the British Library, British public institutions, to rethink what is the role of the public sector. You're not just trying to be a private sector wannabe. What's the role of a British library, a British museum? Um, what is the notion of public value inside the BBC? How is that different from private value? So our first um, seminar series was actually on that. Um, anyway, so it's great to be back here. So the reason um, that we wrote the book is that if you're trying to rethink the public, and I don't just mean the state, literally the concept of public purpose and public value, it's really important to uh, underpin that by looking also at what has happened over time at this kind of decimation of that concept. Um, the notion of the public good, for example, in economics is just framed as, a, as, a, as a, something to correct for a market failure. You know, markets work perfectly, sometimes they fail, governments have to come in to invest in something that's good because the private sector is not investing in it. And there's all sorts of uh, rigorous theoretical uh, uh, bits below that that it won't go into. That's very different from thinking about what are our goals? What are we actually trying to solve? What is the common good? What's the objective, right? So an objective-oriented economy versus a corrective economy. And when I was writing Mission Economy, the book before this, on you know, why don't we do kind of common goals, the common good, outcomes orientation around societal problems, why do we only know how to do it during wartime? Think of the moon landing, which was all about, you know, we're doing it because it's hard, not because it's easy. 400,000 people did it, lots of different sectors, clear uh, a public direction, but lots of different sectors made it happen uh, with, in the private sector. What struck me, was the capacity that was inside that particular public institution, NASA, uh, the, the National Space Agency in the US, the desire to work with others, but the recognition that they themselves, within NASA, needed a brain, needed capacity, needed to insource investments. Otherwise, in the name, in the, um, the, the quote of this guy, Ernest Brackett, who's the head of procurement in NASA, uh, he said, if we don't do that, we're going to get captured by brochuremanship. So this is pre-PowerPoints. Uh, captured by sexy, shiny brochures that the private sector is going to come into NASA and say, we want to you know, work with you to go to the moon. And his point was, we, it's not that we don't want to work with the private sector, but we won't know which private sector institutions to work with. We won't even understand space. We won't know how to write the contracts. We won't know how to write the terms of reference. And that idea of, of NASA getting captured by brochuremanship, you know, speed forwards today, that's basically what's happened. And our book, sorry, not NASA, public institutions have been captured by brochuremanship. And it's, you know, our book is not against consultants. We're against a system, an ecosystem, the way that governments have accepted to work with private companies, and in this book we talk about cons the, the consulting industry, where it's full, first of all full of conflicts of interest, um, which we're going to go into when we go into some examples, but especially the conflict of interest where the partner, so the consulting industry, has very little incentive to actually make the public actor smarter, more able, more capable. Um, and uh, recently, uh, Theodore Agnew, a Tory conservative lord in this country, um, on the back of seeing how much money the UK government was spending on consultants, McKinsey, KPMG, Deloitte, and so on, both during Brexit and during COVID, where the government was spending 1.5 million a day on, uh, 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 on Deloitte doing the test and trace system, which failed quite miserably, not surprisingly. I mean, Deloitte might be great at some things, but test and trace was not their expertise. He said, what are we doing? We are infantilizing government. And this is a Tory conservative lord. He said, we are not allowing our civil servants to actually get their hands dirty with the crunchy, wicked problems of our time, because every time we have some big challenges, the digital divide, Brexit, COVID, we think government's not capable, and we just outsource it. And it also brings a huge democratic uh, problem, right? Because a lot of that then isn't transparent. You know, McKinsey's not accountable to the voter. The government is. Um, and, and you know, really our point is that all the problems that we're facing, the next pandemic, if there is one, 
uh, the climate battle, again, I mentioned the digital divide, but all the sustainable development goals, which every country has signed up to, right? The 17 goals of the United Nations, or young people know what they are, saying them in primary school, the 169 targets beneath them, they require collective intelligence. They require the private sector, the public sector, the rising kind of third sector, even philanthropies, to work together well. But if one of these actors, governments, which are really important because we elect governments, right, um, have stopped investing inside, making their own civil service more capable so it can also work with others well, then we have a problem. And even when they do invest inside, so some of the examples we look at are that even when they do have that capacity, the fear, the, the kind of you know, uh, risk averseness, because as soon as a civil servant makes a mistake, bang, front page of the newspaper, even when they have the capacity, they sometimes prefer to outsource that to someone else. And an example we gave, which Rosie will probably go into more, more detail, was Australia, which spent six million on paying McKinsey to do their climate strategy, and just Google how that went. It didn't go very well, but what was really interesting was not so much how much money was spent, not so much that, um, that it kind of you know, wasn't a very good strategy, but that they actually had the capacity in-house. Uh, in they had invested for decades, uh, actually a decade, in a center, a research center called uh, CSIRO. It's an internal uh, government research center basically around climate. Um, or similarly here, GDS, Government Digital Services, is one of actually the most capable government agencies around uh, digital that, you know, why was the contract for test and trace just automatically given out uh, to a consulting company. Um, and just lastly, lastly, you know, I, I, I mentioned um, Lord Agnew being a conservative. Why? Because sometimes people think that this kind of, you know, anti-government, anti-inward investment is just a, you know, thing on the right. It's not true. Um, it was actually labor. We, we talk about the third way in uh, the book, that it was actually the labor party in some ways in this country that... Uh, increased the amount of outsourcing, interestingly, because the idea was we are not anti-state, you know, we want government investment, but without actually having a theory of what we would call in our institute uh, public purpose and public value, it soon became just kind of bringing in um, ideas from the private sector, kind of ideas of static efficiency, um, ideas of, you know, net present value, cost benefit analysis, uh, into government uh, agencies. And that itself, if you're bringing ideas from the private sector into the public sector, it kind of opens the way even more than to just say, oh, well, why are we even you know, doing it? Let's just outsource this to the private sector. Um, I could go on, but this is becoming a monologue, so why don't I just stop? But just to say that, at least for me, this was very much an evolution of some of the previous work from the entrepreneurial state to mission economy to say it's actually impossible to have moonshots around health climate and the SDGs without that capacity and capability, without dynamic uh, capacity, without also making the civil service feel valued so that they're also allowed to kind of learn by doing trial and error. And if there's so much fear of making mistakes, this idea that it's easier just to rubber stamp decisions uh, with consultants is, is part of the problem. Right. Well, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, I'm going to come to Rosie in just a few moments to ask some about some of the details, particularly in relation to Australia and the climate change story, which is fascinating, and it's told in this book. But before I do, I just want to come back to you, Mariana, and push back a little bit. Um, because one of the things that's very interesting, one of the best examples of this process in your book I found, mm. was when you start talking about IT. Mm. And you, you point out that ever since the in introduction of computers in civil service departments, as early as the 1950s, um, governments had largely maintained IT infrastructure in-house. The point being that, of course, you had a lot of expertise back in the 1950s, and it was indeed US government agencies that created the World Wide Web. Yeah. Things like DARPA created yeah. so much of what we rely on in our digital economy. Um, and then later on, you talk about the fact that actually there were huge um, tendencies for governments to start outsourcing IT services to the point where, as you say, during COVID, they had an in-house IT department, but basically cho chose to outsource that. Now, what I'm curious about is that, um, again, you say later on, you know, it, this was obviously a hugely profitable advisory market for the consultant consultancy industry. The question, though, I have, though, is that 
it is not just government that's been doing this. Mm -hmm. It's been right across the corporate sector. Um, you know, there's barely a company out there that I know of that actually does IT in-house anymore. So to what degree do you think you're talking about something which is just about government structures and public service, or is this just part of a general trend in our modern world mm -hmm. towards more specialization and outsourcing? So this is definitely a place also that Rosie should come in because actually part of her PhD is looking at digitalization and the lack of that capacity within governments. But just to kind of backtrack a bit, so the reason I wrote The Entrepreneurial State was precisely to kind of debunk some of that idea that all the tech, all the IT, all the AI today has come just from the private sector, right? So touchscreen, Siri, internet, um, um, GPS were actually all outcomes, not so much of public like genius, but public investment that required ability to use things like outcomes-oriented procurement to crowd in really innovative solutions, right? Again, that's how we got to the moon. It was outcomes-oriented procurement that got us camera phones, foil blankets, baby formula, software. What then happened, <laughs> basically, over the last 50 years is not only, um, and let me just be a bit simplistic about this, austerity, so lots of cuts to different types of public budgets globally that were actually really important in health and tech and so on, but the governance capacity, right? This is also about governance, it's not just about investment, to govern really difficult so-called wicked problems. It's not about public or private doing the IT. The public sector needs to work with the private sector, even when it's a private provider. And Ernest Brackett's point, we're getting captured by brochuremanship, as I mentioned, was about we won't even know how to work with the private sector, how to do outcomes-oriented procurement. Um, and you know, having said that, some things are absolutely fine to outsource, right? I mean, one could argue about it, but there was a big strike when I was at Sussex, for example, because the students weren't happy that we were outsourcing the catering in the university. And, and there's lots of reasons why actually it's good to do uh, catering inside, especially during lockdowns or in hospitals, food, you know, uh, cleanliness is, you know, uh, uh, hygiene is really important. But digital, you know, data, if you completely outsource it, you literally will not know how to work then with some of those private actors that are doing that decentralized process, right? So this isn't about top-down government doing everything. That would be ridiculous. This is about capable, public, private, third sector actors working well together on really difficult problems. And if you don't have any expertise in-house on digital governance, you will not even know how to work with those who you've outsourced tasks to. Right. Well, Rosie, tell us about the story of McKinsey and climate policy in Australia, because McKinsey crops up a lot in this book. Um, in many ways, they are, it seems, public enemy number one in this. Um, in that, you know, There's a wonderful passage, apart from this, where you talk about McKinsey becoming a go-to in the world of macroeconomic restructuring, and all the European governments have been using McKinsey for managing their debt problems and things. But tell us about the Australian story and um, what happened there. Yeah, thank you, and thank you very much for everyone for being here. Thank you again, Mariana, for taking me on this crazy adventure um, of doing a PhD and writing a book, and thank you, Gillian, for being here. Um, it's a huge pleasure. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, we don't focus on McKinsey on purpose in the book. You know, part of the issue, part of the challenge is that McKinsey does seem to be at the heart of so many of the... Um, crises that we could identify and that we looked we looked at. Someone um, uh, uh, amazingly uh, who reviewed the book for an academic journal actually made a list of all the cases that we had um, mm. uh, uh, that we had done, and that, that apparently we didn't have too many of one um, consulting company. There were 80 case studies that we included in the book. Um, but so in the case of McKinsey in Australia, so I don't know, is there any anyone here who is following Australian politics? Um, closely, or anyone who is Australian, maybe you are aware of some of these. Okay, great. So um, you will know, you will know, be very aware that the Australian government's problem with consultancies is not just about its relationship with McKinsey. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the, the case that we talk about in the book, which is uh, the Australian government's contracting of McKinsey to help develop its essentially net, net zero strategy 
that um, as a signatory to the Paris Agreement, it was required to develop, um, all signatories to the Paris Agreement um, are required to develop nationally determined contributions plans, and the Australian government developed a strategy to do this. When their report was launched at COP um, in 2021, which COP was that? I'm, I've got my PhD brain on. I've got COP numbers floating around <laughs> um, everywhere at the moment. But COP in 2021, it was ranked by some of these independent indexes um, that look at all of the strategies of different governments around the world as 60th out of 60th, uh, 60th out of 60 in terms of um, whether it would actually enable the Australian government to reach um, net zero or, or enable Australia to transition to a net zero economy. Um, and when, when commentators and climate analysts started digging into this, um, they realised that the modelling was completely full of holes, uh, completely full of holes, and that um, the, it, in the, indeed the models did not enable or would not enable the government to reach net zero. I think I think it enabled them to get 80% of the way to net zero, and then there was this huge reliance on technologies that ha uh, do not currently exist and are very far from existing to reach the rest of it. Um, there was also some kind of dubious um, you know, proposals within that uh, 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 around you know, Australia's um, uh, uh, transition away from coal. Um, now, McKinsey was contracted by the Australian government to develop uh, the, the analysis underpinning this strategy. Um, now, one of the things that commentators also picked up on was the fact that at the time that McKinsey had been doing this work for the Australian government, it had also been recently advising um, 53 of the 100 biggest polluters. I think that's the number we use in the book. So that it was not just an issue yeah. with the modelling, um, but you know, critics were arguing Arguing, and, and this is a problem across the um, sector, that this was also a huge conflict of interest with, um, uh, with this work. And indeed, uh, yeah, those of you who know about the PwC um, tax crisis, and I, I won't keep talking about that now, um, will know that the conflict of interest issue has been at the heart of this as well. Um, so perhaps that's something we'll get to shortly. But right. just on that, just in case people don't know, the conflict of interest that you, you just mentioned, because there's so many different conflicts of interest, mm -hmm. is when you're on both sides of the street. So another thing that happened in Australia was that PwC was advising the medical device industry while also uh, consulting with the regulators who are regulating the medical device sector. I mean, it's kind of not rocket science that that's a problem. Uh, in South Africa, consulting with ESCOM, the state-owned enterprise for energy, while they're also consulting with the Treasury that's supposed to be regulating ESCON. Um, so, so which governments are the worst? We know, so we well, know. Rosie's got the data, so Rosie. Yeah, yeah, we do know. I mean, we, we both have the data, but we do know that statistically, it has been um, what is referred to in economics and the social sciences as um, the Anglo-Saxon economies. So that is um, Australia, the United States, New Zealand, um, and uh, and Canada. Um, uh, and the UK. And the UK, of course, the UK, of course, the UK um, comes in very close after the United States. I think States. every government. I mean, the reason. So I was. Um, uh, advising for free, uh, the Italian uh, prime minister during COVID, and there was a COVID commission, um, and that commission was full of consultants. Um, and whereas we as commissioners had been selected, some academics, some ex-business people, somehow they were all there for free, right? So the idea was, oh, but we're here just helping for free because Italian civil service is so inept, they can't even take minutes. Not true, by the way. Uh, so the idea that you are in a room, right, for free, just helping the government with a task like taking minutes, but obviously collecting huge amounts of information because then what happened fast forward is that the next gen EU recovery program, which is close to two trillion euros, uh, got handed out to different countries, including Italy. Italy actually got one of the highest percentages and uh, surprise, surprise, McKinsey is, you know, at that time was under Draghi actually, next government was um, uh, consulted in to help uh, structure the Italian recovery program and then all the contracts, right? So I think that contract was just 25,000 or something. So we call this low balling. You're either in for free or for a very low amount. But then the, the next contracts that happen, and there's a huge multiplier effects because this is, again, two trillion across Europe to build infrastructure, digital health infrastructure, so on and so forth. These, these, these contracts are huge. 
right? So, but it's, it's more the democratic deficit. In other words, why are you even in the room? And if you are in the room, what is the accountability, right, to make sure that, again, there aren't these conflicts of interest, like the one that, that uh, Rosie just mentioned in South Africa, but also that need to invest within the civil service. So in Italy, every time we've had a riforma della pubblica amministrazione, Sounds great, right? Anything in Italian sounds wonderful. It sounds like opera. It ends up just being a reform of the civil service, which ultimately is just cuts. No one really argues in Europe, as part of this next-gen EU, that in order to administer it, in order to implement it, in order to work well with private institutions, and even to work well with consultants, we need to invest within the civil service's ability. So one of the things we also argue for is the need to kind of revive uh, uh, institutions like GovLabs, uh, the, like in Chile they have um, Laboratorio de Gobierno, again sounds good, it's in Spanish, so it's basically a GovLab, it's a safe place within government basically to make mistakes. Um, and, and so unless we actually create a learning culture, a knowledge culture, admit that we need collective intelligence between all the different actors so they work together symbiotically, towards collective goals and not parasitically, as we've seen in the health sector, for example, then it's impossible to confront the 21st century challenges. Right, well, I'm gonna come back in a moment and ask you about how to fix this, but before I do, Rosie, did you find in all your data crunching any evidence or examples or stories of governments actually fighting back and saying no to consultants? So we have seen that, uh, we have a few cases of that actually. The case that we talk about in the book is the Danish government's decision to introduce a cap on spending on consultancies. So we all think of Denmark as being this, you know, wonderful welfare state, and indeed it is um, a, a very big government, has a very big public sector. Um, but even there, um, in 2019, the government had identified that spending on management consultants had steadily increased. Um, and they basically said, right, we need to uh, cut my, uh, this spending in half, and they introduced a cap. And they didn't just um, introduce that limit, they also established an in-house public sector consultancy because they recognised that many of the departments across the government had by then become dependent on um, external consultants as a kind of source of, uh, of capacity to deliver kind of critical tasks, even things like budget evaluations, um, you know, were being done externally and this sort of thing. Um, so instead they established this internal public sector wide uh, uh, public sector management consultancy um, that became a way for, uh, or a way of ensuring that the government didn't lose this capacity um, or didn't have a kind of shortfall in capacity. Yeah. When they did that, yeah. That's but fascinating. Well, bless the it. question of fighting back is a problem because it's actually, the governments have, it's almost self-harm. Like, we don't actually blame consulting companies. It's not that they have pushed their way in. Governments have been part of that problem. They have, you know, uh, implemented this kind of decimation of the capacity. Right. And I think that's very important because we're also not against consulting. You know, nurses consult, doctors consult, academics consult. We're looking at an industry that has a very problematic relationship with governments as kind of sectors. And the ecosystem right. is, again, kind of parasitic, predator-prey, <laughs> and not symbiotic and mutualistic. And that can be changed if government itself wills it to be changed. Well, I find the Danish example very interesting because, you know, apart from the fact my other half is Danish, um, Denmark often strikes me as a gigantic Boy Scout camp where everyone is kind of nice to everyone else and wants to do the right thing and observe the rules and has a very strong sense of pride in being Danish <laughs> and a very strong sense of respect for what it means to be part of a collective community and collective Danish community. And they've just come off, you know, several decades of a remarkable turnabout story in terms of growth and dynamism, which may be one reason why the government has the confidence to actually even look at these issues, which most European gov countries right now don't. And I'm curious, you know, if you look at, say, the Danish example, where they actually have said, whoa, let's try and actually look at what's happening here and try and imagine another model. If you were writing a script for the rest of Europe today or the UK, about how to do this more rationally. Mm -hmm. You know, what would your five-part consultancy plan be for how to get rid of consultants? <laughs> <laughs> Other than we can all become Danish. So we actually have a five-point plan in the conclusion. I gave you that lead, <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll mention two <laughs> of the points. For those who haven't if read the want, book, yeah. make, it, make it snappy. I mean, so. the first is really to rethink the civil service, what it's for. As long as it's there just to, re you know, to uh, regulate, to administer, to fix markets, and so on, then there's no reason to have a brain. 
right? So that kind of need to really move away, again, in the Institute, we always start with this, you know, putting kind of the public and the public sector and, and, and the civil service at the center of a wealth creation process in order to also direct value creation in a better way. That just requires a completely different capacity and capability. So the first point is rethink why you even need a civil service and invest in it. Second, the contracts with the consulting industry or a consultant, even an individual, doesn't have to be the industry, needs to embed the remit of learning. Make sure that within the contract, contract part of the purpose of that relationship is actually to be more capable. Because if you're not, then you will ultimately become addicted and will need, right? Like, like if you're in therapy for your whole life, it might be that your therapist isn't necessarily the best therapist. So you would want, surely, to make sure that you have you know, a customer-client kind of relationship that is one that also has an end uh, point. Um, but also this whole issue of the conflict of interest, about being on both sides of the street, when, you know, when I said before, it's not rocket science. You can actually embed that, obviously, into law. And in some cases, it is actually technically into law, but there's so much um, lack of transparency and accountability, as Rosie said. Not, you know, most Australians didn't know that McKinsey was also working with the biggest uh, fossil uh, emitters. But feel free to go through the other... Uh, two or three points. Go through the, well, yeah, yeah. the two missing points. The two, which were or the two, two and a half. Oh, God. So we have, uh. you know, no, no, I'm just, I'm just going to have a look at the book. No, I mean, but fundamentally, this speaks to the, the crux of the, the so the, I think the two ones that we didn't talk about here are um, also just this need to rethink what constitutes a consultant, right? Yeah. So uh, Marianne has obviously just alluded to this, but we think that's pretty critical. Um, you know, governments, mm -hmm. insofar as they always need to respond to evolving challenges in society, evolving needs of citizens, evolving political demands of citizens, they need to be able to change. Um, and, and in that process of changing, they are going to encounter new challenges. Now, if they invest internally in developing their capabilities um, over time, then that puts them in a very good position to be able to respond and, and adapt and be agile. This is um, in referencing uh, Rainer Cattell's uh, book as well, um, who's at the back there, um, you know, be able to adapt. Um, but um, in those situations, they will need to work with other actors. Mm -hmm. And we need to rethink, you know, what do we mean? Why, why do so many governments, or why do so many civil servants, um, when they are encountering a challenge, have a knee-jerk reaction or, you know, are kind of forced to have a knee-jerk reaction to go to one of the big three or the big four instead of thinking more critically about, um, you know, which actors are actually or who, who is best placed to be able to help them to overcome right. challenges in the interests of citizens as well. So how has the reaction been from the management consultants? Uh, emails, lots of them, uh, individually, <laughs> many uh, ex-addicts. <laughs> um, so many people who worked in the consulting industry actually reached out to us to say it's, it's even worse, basically, mm -hmm. than what you're saying. And lots of, I mean, if we did a part two, we haven't talked about it, maybe we should, or, or a Netflix series, we would have lots <laughs> more case studies because they just kind of, you know, told us all these horror stories. By the way, one of the things we didn't talk about, which you alluded to, which we didn't answer your question, was this is just as bad in the private sector. So, one of the, so that's why the subtitle is um, how the consulting industry weakens our businesses, infantilizes our governments, and warps our economies. That weakening our businesses, again, it's not necessarily the consultant's fault. When you have businesses that are downsizing, so firing workers, that are having massive share buyback schemes, like $7 trillion have been used by the top 500 companies in the last 10 years just to buy back their shares, to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. When they have practices like that, whether it's downsizing, mergers and acquisitions, uh, shareholder value maximizing, that ends up with these massive share buybacks, it's nice just to kind of rubber stamp it as though the, it, you know, the practice came in as advice from a consultant. In other words, it's kind of a cowardly way not to own up to your own decisions, especially when you know those decisions might be um, controversial. So in the same way that governments to, you know, fear full of risk, we look at how both the kind of, you know, problematic practices like share buybacks and downsizing, but also the good practices like ESG, environmental and social governance uh, criteria for governments, but also the climate strategies, as long as they're rubber stamped by a consultant, somehow it'll go down the throat more internally of the board or of whoever. So it's really in some ways a call to action, but a call to to uh, bravery within all the different actors to own the decisions and also to learn to work better together. 
and especially that whole democratic deficit problem, right? I mean, it is about, again, owning right. decisions that are often political decisions, if, if we're talking about governments, or you know, potentially controversial decisions. Uh, but the five, just to make sure we just state them, I won't explain them. The first was a new vision, narrative, and remit for the civil service. Second, invest in the internal capacity and capability creation. Uh, third, embed learning and an endpoint into contract evaluation, right? So it's not in therapy your whole life. Fourth, mandate transparency and conflicting interest disclosure. The thing about being on both sides of the street. And maybe you want to say something about the fifth one because um, it, it, it became very important in the book, uh, a government that rose so it can steer and where that kind of slow. What, what does that mean? That sounds a bit like a management consultancy slogan. Yeah, it does. Well, it, well <laughs> it in fact, it, it is. A it, it is. It was. Um, so, in, uh, so earlier, Mariana talked about how this was not just a problem of kind of 1980s neoliberal Thatcher Reagan, right? We actually saw um, a huge, uh, rapid growth in outsourcing in governments that had adopted this um, kind of paradigm called the third way. So new labor in the UK, Clinton in, in the United States, other governments in uh, well, uh, across Europe and Australia. Um, and in the 1990s, um, in, in response to the um, neoliberalization, that's a horrible word, of government, so where governments had increasingly outsourced, increasingly privatized um, things during the 1980s, in response to this, this movement grew among um, academics and among uh, policy makers and, and, and also management consultants who were saying, you know, we need actually government, to, we do need government to come back in. Um, we need government to be able to steer the ship of the economy and to steer society. So government has an act, uh, does have an important role in this regard, but it doesn't need to do things um, if they are cheaper and more effective to do in the um, private sector. And this was captured in this slogan of government should steer but not row. Um, so what we say at the end of the book, towards the end of the book, is that actually if you have a government um, that is not able to row, then it will lose the ability to steer. So it's a bit of a, um, yeah, I, I guess a bit of a convoluted metaphor, but that's why we have it there and why it sounds like management consulting jargon was because it was. <laughs> a bit of, <laughs> exactly what it's called, um, yeah, doing jujitsu on the management consultants, so like <laughs> stealing their own um, slogans to use against them. Um, I'm curious, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions in a few minutes, but I have two other big questions. Um, firstly, I'm curious, um, I asked you earlier, you know, what are the worst offenders? I asked you then which governments have actually pushed back. Mm. Um, are there any governments that have actually taken this five-part plan to heart and actually implemented it or never actually used consultants in the first place? You know, I'm curious, for example, about a country like Singapore, which has a very different model of public service and civil service. Um, in many ways, I think it's probably one of the most effectively run governments um, out there um, in terms of actually having holistic joined up policy making. Yeah. Um, not talking about freedom of speech or anything like that, but in terms of holistic policy making, they are very effective. And I don't think they've ever used consultants much, have they? I mean, but are there other examples you can think of where governments are actually doing the right thing already? I mean, one of the things that we do, again, in the Institute is we have, like, case studies, right? Think of the Harvard case study, uh, MBA uh, kind of uh, methodology, where because they value business, then, of course, you want to understand how business works, what works, what doesn't. There's very few case studies of public institutions, precisely because we've kind of undervalued them. And so, for me, at least the question is not which country is perfect, which country has done everything great, but what are the cases, the examples, like GDS, to be honest, in the UK, which is a super interesting uh, example, and how can we learn from those cases to scale them up? In the history of GDS, I don't know if any of the GDS, is, is Mike Bracken here? He said he'd come. Are you? Ah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> so we should just start calling out a bunch of people and get, and get them to come on stage. And that's government but, um, digital services. Government Digital Services, yeah. GDS, Mike Bracken, Tom Lusmore, and others who set it up. And Mike, I know I'm, I'm giving the simplistic story here, but you know, government wanted a web, a, 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 a government tech platform, and initially did what many governments do, which was to think that you know, oh, government's done, we can't do it. Circo, let's get Circo or some other private provider. Circo did a terrible job. It was actually people that had I, you know, BBC iPlayer type experience who then came into the cabinet office and said, this is ridiculous, we can do this, set, set up GDS, set up gov.uk, which wins an international design award, makes it also one of the sexiest places to work if you're a computer geek, a software designer, uh, which by the way, we haven't talked about that, but the talent drain 
from governments to the private sector, reversing that is exactly what GDS did because of the inspirational leadership, just made it a really attractive place for young techie kind of folks uh, to go. Um, and examples like that where you're not just setting up a website, right, this wasn't a tech fix, but actually a way for government, for example, to work better between departments, right? We need interdepartmental, interministerial collaboration. Everyone talks about that, but that doesn't happen, both because governments, you know, uh, uh, ministries like to work in their own silos, but also some of the te underlying technology, the infrastructure, doesn't actually enable that. Um, so, you know, we're very interested in examples like that, as well as the GovLab kind of example that I mentioned before, that itself in some ways is a pushback against consulting because it's an admission that you actually need to invest in the experimentation, the learning by doing the trial and error and error right. and error, which you know venture capitalists are allowed to fail and even brag about it, but we don't admit that actually that experimentation and that for each success you need to bear with eight or nine failures in government too. But then how do you learn from that failure? You need to invest in that capacity to learn. But I'm curious, though, because you point out the talent is a key element of all this. Um, and, you know, the idea of becoming a civil servant is not exactly wildly sexy and cool mm -hmm. as far as, you know, much of the, you know, younger generation is the concerned The average right age now. in NASA was 25 uh, during the Apollo mission. It was extremely attractive to work in there. And, and, you know, it's not just about the space race. Obama, after the financial crisis, while here we did austerity, in Europe, we did austerity. The US had an 800 billion stimulus program. And initially, Obama said he wanted to direct it towards a green kind of redirection of the economy. That made it extremely attractive for some of the top kind of energy scientists to go into government. He managed to get a Nobel Prize winning physicist to run the Department of Energy, Steve Chu, a Chinese American. Mm -hmm. The first thing they did was to set up ARPA-E, like DARPA, DARPA, you know famous for the internet, ARPA-E was like an equivalent, but in the energy space. That attracted some top talent. Arun Majumdar was the first director. He ultimately went to do Google's energy plan. But the point is, would Steve Chu have wanted to be a minister of energy leading the DOE had the remit been, oh, come in and help us de-risk Elon Musk or help us do a carbon tax? No, directing an 800 billion stimulus program in a green direction, that's very attractive. And obviously, it doesn't have to be 800 billion, but the point is, as you said with the Singapore example, Tarman Shagmutaran is actually quite a good friend of mine, he's the president, he talks about this, that the remit, the kind of mission-oriented remit of the Singaporean government and all the different agencies is what attracts the top talent. But you see, one of the things I'm really curious about in the case of Britain, because um, even as Obama was doing this, mm -hmm. someone like Paul Volcker, you know, a great public um, servant, um, created an institute at the Harvard G. Kennedy School to try and inspire the next generation of civil servants and found it incredibly difficult to actually get funding or to even make it particularly, um, you know, put it on the radar properly because there just wasn't this appetite to support um, civil servants and to try and train up the next generation in a really excited, committed way. So I'm curious, Rosie, um, you look like you're part of the younger generation. <laughs> um, what can be done to make people, students, people your age, feel really excited about going into civil servants and actually doing public service for the wider good and not just trying to outsource everything to consultants? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. And we discuss it a lot in the book, actually. We talk about how this is a systemic issue, right? This isn't just about um, governments being bad at offering jobs or consultancies being very good at, at jobs. We recognise, you know, I, I yes, I graduated not so long ago from two political science degrees. And I can tell you that in both of the universities where I studied that, um, going to do a graduate scheme for a management consultancy was the graduate scheme part Oxalons that everyone wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and in the book, we look at why, um, you know, what attracts people to do that. And we see that actually these companies do invest crazy amounts of money also in recruiting graduates. And they have huge promises like, you know, we will support your learning and development. Um, you will be at the forefront of the green transition. You will get lots of experience and lots of, this isn't an advert to go and do one of these schemes, <laughs> by the way. Um, uh, you, will, you will be able to get lots of experience and lots of different, uh, in lots of different areas. And hey, guess what? You'll also be able to pay rent in London, right? Now, we, we know that that is not the case for a lot of civil service positions unfortunately so this is fundamentally also you know a, 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 a 
uh, yeah, a systemic issue. We need we need to not only create civil service jobs that are um, interesting, that support people's learning, but that fundamentally pay well, um, so that people can uh, be able to make the choice, have have the freedom to make the choice between you know going to one of these management consultancy schemes. Which, by the way, actually, the Financial Times did a great report. Um, I think it was from last year, looking at the growing disillusionment among young management consultants, um, and that's certainly something that we found. Um, you know, we uh, there was there was a time when we were both getting dozens of emails a day, which was amazing, um, you know, from, from people who had read the book, um, who were quite young as well, who had been in consulting and then come out um, and were just feeling completely disillusioned because it wasn't living up to the promises that they had been promised um, when they had gone into the career and they kind of didn't know what to do next. Um, so, yeah, that's something we think is, is an issue. But, you know, we think most people probably go into it for the right reasons, but they become disillusioned very quickly. Right. Um, my last question before I turn to the audience, um, though I've got plenty more if nobody else wants to ask questions, um, but you look like quite an engaged audience, so start thinking of what you, what you want to ask. Um, but my last question is, do you have much hope that somebody like Rachel Reeves will take this book to heart? If a Labour government gets in, will they start being tough on consultants? To be tough on consultants, you need to invest within the capacity, within government. So the biggest task right now for the Labour Party is to have a new economic narrative. So instead of saying, we'll do it, you know, 28 billion on green, oh no, we won't, we'll do a bit less because we don't have the money, to completely changing how we think about the economy so that by having active, strategic, what we would call mission-oriented public investment, working well with the private sector, in fact, embedding conditionality within any public program, a bailout, a subsidy, a guarantee, a loan, conditional and private sector investment towards the goals, um, as opposed to just you know, subsidies and guarantees, just because you're giving subsidies and guarantees, that can catalyze real, not just economic growth, expansion of productive capacity, but directed, right? Directed towards solving the biggest problems the country has around inequality, around climate, around the digital divide, all the problems that we've talked about. So by, by thinking like that, the problem is no longer how much money do you have? Do you have enough money to invest in the civil service? Do you have enough money to have a green transition? It's how do you do it smartly in a way that catalyzes a, a real multiplier of public and private investment? And by the way, private investment in this country is below OECD average. Um, it's, it's quite telling that during COVID, a lot of the bailouts, the money that was given actually to the private sector was not conditional on any sort of kind of private sector investment. Whereas in France, the money, for example, that went to Renault and Air France was conditional on those companies reducing their carbon emissions, which requires innovation and investment. Uh, in, in Germany, a, a country that actually that has some good examples, they even have this in-house consulting within the public sector called PD the way that they've been giving out public loans through their public bank in recent years has been conditional on sectors like steel and cement, which are very carbon uh, producing, to reduce the material content of production, for example. So the reason we have green steel in Germany is because of that smart conditionality embedded in a public loan program. So I think what labor needs is much more language like that. Instead of being kind of a Tory light saying, oh, we're green, the Tories aren't green, but there's no money for green, which just doesn't sound very smart. It's really like rethinking how you even talk about budgets in such a way that you're not focusing on short-term deficits or debt figures, but on that long-run expansion of productive capacity with a direction towards sustainability, health, and well-being of the population. And if they do that, and they do it with examples, and you know we're all about kind of examples, and the Institute itself has been working with very local entities like Camden Council, but also big governments like Brazil, and, and really kind of embedding that new language, that new growth narrative, so it's not either you do climate or you grow, you grow by um, really transforming how all sectors, nutrition, materials, transport, work, digital, which is cross-cutting across everything, that doesn't feel right now that is at the top, if you want, of the manifesto. And right. that requirement then to accompany that with a massive wave of inward investment in the capability of the civil service to govern these problems with other actors really, I think, would be a very important progressive narrative for labor. Right. Have you spoken to Rachel Reeves directly about the book? <laughs> 
Um, about the mission economy book, yes. In fact, you might know that, mission, that uh, Labor has adopted this missions approach, but they didn't read the book enough to realize that growth is not the mission. <laughs> uh, growth is the result if you do this stuff well. Um, no, we haven't actually talked to the labor. I mean, in, like privately, yes, you know, but not to labor as a as an so with Ed Miliband, for example, we've talked quite a bit about right. the need to do green and uh, public sector capacity building at the same time. Right. Well, I don't think Rachel Reeves is in the audience, sadly, but plenty of very smart people are. So um, we're going to have some questions now from the audience. We can also have questions online. If you want to put in your questions, do send them over online. But otherwise, um, we're going to go to good old-fashioned hand, wa hand waving. Um, I can see a number of hands straight away. Um, let's start just near the microphone on that side of the aisle and then the other side of the aisle. Um, it would be courteous but not compulsory to identify yourself. Um, and please keep your questions or comments brief so that I can get as many of you into the conversation as possible. Hi, my name is Rachel Headings. I'm a PhD student at University of York and I'm working around political economy issues of food and food systems. Um, so one of the recurring themes throughout all of your work is this idea of redefining value and public good, common good, and better defining what we're aiming toward in terms of, you know, what what do we actually want to achieve? What, on a moral level, on a value level, are we trying to do? My question is, and you just touched on this a bit in your response, but on a very practical level, how do we start engaging in these really big conversations around how we define these really big, scary topics, especially when so much around values and mm. um, ideas are embedded and based on assumptions and people don't even necessarily have the language or capacity to think about these on the day to day. So how, when we're trying to facilitate change, do we start these conversations about what do we mean by value and by public good and common good? Mm -hmm. So how do we get time to think? Do you want to think about that, or should I answer let's it straight away? Two or three. Yeah, let's take two or three. Okay. On the other side, just the other side of the aisle, and there's a question over there. Yeah. Um, the question I'd like to ask is: Have you given much thought to the role that quangos can play in this, maybe a reinvention of quangos? And I wanted to share my experience of the very short-lived Commission for Architecture and Built Environment. Sorry, can you raise your hand? Sorry, I can't see you. Yeah. Oh, there Sorry. you are. Yeah, the Commission <laughs> Commission for Architecture and Built Environment. There was an extraordinary organisation on very, very tiny amount of government money. It sat between private sector and public sector, speaking truth to power, um, had that independence, thought leadership, and it was an incredible, um, sexy and exciting place to work and attracted some amazing people. So, um, mm -hmm. so the role of Quengos, I guess. Is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll take um, one more question just further on the road, and then I'll come on to this side over here to be balanced. Um, one more over there. Yeah, okay, yeah, yes, there. And they'll have three, and then we'll, then we'll have some answers and then go move forward. Uh, my name is Cipriana Lupe, University of Greenwich. My question is mostly so you know how you mentioned that consult like uh, management consultants are kind of your nurse or your consultants in the NHS. I was wondering who is the GP that writes the referral? to the management consultants, and is there any role that uh, party-affiliated think tanks play in that decision? Mm. Interesting. Do you want to go first? Just a second. Do you want me to go first? Okay. So thank you for those questions. Excellent. Um, I'll perhaps address the first one. You want to take one? Um, so, you know, what's interesting is, again, we work with so many different uh, governments in the institute. We also train civil servants. A lot of our master's students are here. It's a master's in public administration trying to change, uh, actually, the curriculum, the training of bureaucrats so that the word bureaucracy is actually an interesting, nice word, you know, a, a creative bureaucracy, as, as, as Reiner's book uh, has in its title. Um, but a lot of the governments that we work with trying to kind of instill some of this thinking are like, you know, again, Brazil, Colombia, Germany, Spain. But my lessons for the question you've just asked is more at the very, very local level. Um, so the work that we've been doing in Camden Council, we are in Camden Council today, um, setting up kind of five different missions, right? So the whole point of missions is to say there's you know, huge problems out there that actually require every sector uh, and every actor, public, private, third sector, but also sectors in the business sector to work with government to solve. 
but that doesn't happen just by, again, having an industrial strategy that gives that money to the life sciences sector, right? So missions, problems that really galvanize that public-private uh, partnership. But then the question, I think, that comes from your question is who decides what the missions are? Like, is it this top-down, Kennedy-style moon landing but applied to the SDGs, or how do we truly co-create by, first of all, giving, like, by valuing people, by actually valuing them enough to give them voice to actually co-create and have a voice in setting these missions. So even though you know SDG 13 around climate change is really abstract, then nesting it, negotiating it, contextualizing it at the very local level, the first thing that we did with Camden was also to bring, for example, resident associations and um, citizen assemblies at the local level to the table to even define what do we mean by a green mission. Secondly, to give dignity and self-worth to people. So during COVID, and we were working during COVID, there was a huge rise of food banks, right? Inequality is alive and well in this country. It's one of the most unequal countries in the OECD. Uh, transforming the food banks into food cooperatives, right? Where the people benefiting from a food bank, which is very important, were also in charge um, and felt dignity in that process and a green food bank, right? So really nesting the green also in the everyday. I mean, one of the, coming back to the, the country examples, uh, another interesting example that we, sorry, work that we've done has been in Sweden where at a very high level, their mission is to have a fossil free welfare state, but then that falls at the everyday like school meals. And I'm an Arsenal supporter, so I don't like talking about Manchester United, but you know, Marcus Rashford should win a massive prize for the work he did during COVID, reminding us all how important school meals are. But what was interesting in Sweden was that the discussion about school meals also became interesting because school meals in Sweden have to be healthy, tasty, and sustainable. So again, the climate mission runs through the everyday, whether it's a food cooperative in Camden, a, a school meals, in Sweden or anywhere. So really making sure that as many parts of the community, right, at the local level are part of that negotiation, that word co-creation that we often throw out there, but co-creation doesn't happen without people actually having a voice at the table to discuss these issues around directionality. And I think there's lots of lessons to be learned how to do that well and not tokenistically and then scale up those lessons from the local to the regional to the national and surely at the global level. Our work with the European Commission, which really got missions to even be something, there's a missions instrument today in Europe because of our work, my, my uh, lesson was that there was no co-creation whatsoever. It definitely was very top down and maybe at that regional, sorry, community level, that was the only way to do it and that it falls on cities, regions, uh, member states across Europe and that's where that negotiation happens. Um, do you want to take the Quango one? Yeah, Rosie. Yeah, I mean, just very briefly, I can say, I mean, certainly we do need to think about how government is structured, right, and, and how we achieve, you know, when we set missions, something Marianne has also written about in Mission Economy, when we set these missions, we do need to think about how government is organised in, mm. in order to achieve them. And, you know, from my own PhD research, that is certainly true with pursuing green transitions, that's quite important. Um, but, um, you know as fundamentally is how they are resourced and, and how they structure their, what, you know, what we call government production, how, how, they, how they structure what they do. Um, and Quango's um, actually specifically, and arm's length bodies in general, um, in the UK and in many other countries have been among the biggest users of consultancies um, for the reason, or, or, or you know, the literature suggests that it is because they are sort of slightly out of view of the um, you know, direct, direct line of political scrutiny so they're able to get away with it a bit more um so so yeah i mean potentially but i think more generally we need to think about how government is structured just very quickly on the if i understood this who writes the referral um you know gov governments do have bidding processes you know there aren't uh, of course during the pandemic some of these got uh, you know particularly during the pandemic and otherwise also it does happen they get subverted in ways that are you know completely undemocratic frankly and um corrupt but um you know there are there are bidding processes there, there are tender and procurement processes that are in place. What the real challenge is, is that the, the big three and the big four companies in particular and other very large consulting companies that we talk about in the book, 
um, are able to invest huge amounts in their bids um, so, so that the, the kind of premise of having this equal playing field for all of the companies to bid on a contract and that their expertise, their knowledge, their value creating potential will automatically shine through in this process. Um, it, it, it doesn't work in practice um, because the um, very large companies are able to lowball, they're able to invest huge amounts in, you know, they have whole departments dedicated to writing tenders for companies, right? So this kind of, uh, you know, idea that this is a free market of value creation and, uh, and ideas and knowledge just doesn't actually work in, in, in practice. Right. Um, are there any questions online? Perhaps I should quickly ask, or while, while you're gathering up the questions online, let me quickly take, take the question over there, lady over there. Um, Laurie Gourley from one of these um, consulting firms that we've referenced. So thank you very much for the invitation. Now I know why you've invited me, Marianne. <laughs> thank you. I might reconsider the next invitation. <laughs> um, but please, may I just ask a question relating to the time frame, right? So agree with everything. Of course, you know I agree with everything um, that you said in broad principles. But what about a notion of time? We know how long governments exist. We know that these grand challenges, your phrase, um, are highly fragmented, whether it's climate change, nature, social, whatever's happening, biodiversity, the global south, any displacement that happens, these are, you know, multi-decade issues that yeah. impact our climate or our planet. And what do we do? What, what about the factor of time? Mm, that's a really good question. That's a great question. Even um, for a consultant, such a good question. Okay, we got a que <laughs> question just in front of her over there. And then <clears throat> take... Sarah Strang, artist and curator. I'm really interested in uh, the value or the description of what is lost. So it's very easy to understand, you know, the big hits, the money that's lost. For example, the post office scandal, you know, you can easily see the lives and the impact and the understanding of how simple the problem was. And I really want to hear from you, Mariana, in the ph philosophical problems that we're facing with this issue and actually the longevity of those problems so we're losing experience we're losing inspiration we're losing creativity and we just have to look at arts and culture and the instrumentalism that's happened there to see how long term those problems can be right okay and we'll take one more um just down over here um down down the front um maybe yeah gentleman there hello my name's thomas heatherwick i'm a designer working in architecture uh, and i'm um, it, it, it seems that the root of this is blame avoidance. Oh, and you see, exactly. how the heck you, can you break that human nature is everyone wants to point to someone else. And obviously it's also a great story because it, you can say that you slim down government. But how do we change the societal way because we've got such transparency that your screw-ups are very visible and it's so much simpler to point and say they screwed up and in the world of architecture, we've had the problem that local authorities had quite spectacular in-house teams, yeah. but there was quite a lot of kind of bad response to the 1960s, what got built. And so it sort of all shrunk away as the confidence drifted away. But how do we change the societal bit that makes it the, the, the Daily Mail attack factor that makes yeah. human nature just have to avoid that well, those are all fantastic questions um yeah i hear someone saying get rid of the media um <laughs> <laughs> if in doubt the one thing everyone can agree to agree on these days is it's probably the journalist's fault yeah. um but um but yeah so how do you get rid of the blame culture i'm fascinated by the culture issue because i originally trained as a cultural anthropologist oh. and i do think that the blame pattern blame culture is absolutely insidious right now in the yeah. modern world but how do we deal with the blame culture how do we deal with missed opportunities, opportunity costs in particular? Um, Short terms. Yeah. So um, maybe starting with the last one, Thomas, I don't think there's anything deterministic or human nature in it. I think you're absolutely right in pointing to these different places where we've seen it. But in some ways, you know, I've been arguing for a long time that we've engineered this risk averseness within at least the public service bit that, we're, that we've been talking about today. In other words, again, if at best, 
you're fixing markets. At best, you're administering, regulating. At best, you're de-risking who? The risk takers, right? You've kind of been set up to fail. Like all the cool words, you know, creation, uh, you know, value creation, or, or just look at the MBA programs, you know, strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. These are all words that admit that you can actually struggle with really difficult, complex problems. There's textbooks called Rejuvenating the Mature Corporation. Why? Because mature corporations, when they get big and clunky and bureaucratic, they need to rejuvenate themselves, right? Think out of the box. There's very little of that in the MPA programs, right? So we have a public sector which has been trained to think at best of itself as enabling, facilitating, de-risking, fixing, administering. You literally want to fall asleep. Central banks that save the capitalist system from falling apart after the financial crisis are lenders of last resort, right? As opposed to state banks that we've seen globally are investors of first resort. So that kind of Singapore question that we asked about before, if you actually set up governments and agencies, right, it's not governments, public agencies to have a remit that they are co-creating, they are taking risks, sharing risks and rewards, you can bet that the risk-taking culture will be different and then it will be admitted that you might make mistakes. So instead of fearing that mistake and blaming someone else, that blame culture, it might be uh, that there might, you know, God forbid, even be a remit that you're supposed to make mistakes. And in fact, DARPA and ARPA-E, back in 2014, I got all the so-called mission-oriented agencies together and said, how do you do it? What do you do? What's your human resource structure like? And Cheryl Martin, who was the second director of ARPA-E, said, we actually uh, evaluate people within the agency by how much risk they were willing to take. So if you never make mistakes, you're kind of booted out because they think you just didn't take risks. Um, and how much economy-wide impact your success have, successes have. And I think that comes to um, your question because that short-termism, you know, we have short-termism in the private sector, you know, the bottom line, shareholder value, maximization, quarterly returns. We also have short-termism in the public sector because of the electoral cycle. But if you actually start doing these case studies that I was saying is very useful to do, you start asking interesting questions like, well, how did an organization like DARPA, and why do we just have it in the defense departments? Why don't we have more DARPAs and social kind of, you know, uh, departments, how did they actually um, uh, incentivize kind of long-term thinking, risk-taking towards big public goals? And there's no reason that that, you know, it's, it's not about copying and pasting. Again, local contexts matter and government departments matter. It's not as easy, perhaps, as it is in the military-industrial complex landscape because our wicked problems need also regulatory change, behavioral change. But that, that idea that actually we need strategic outcomes oriented, mission orientation towards all the sustainable development goals, immediately we should start asking ourselves how do we then create organizations which second in, for example, as DARPA does, people in for five years, those five years don't coincide with the electoral cycle. They explicitly say, come on, you're here to help us go after these really wicked problems and don't think it's a linear. Uh, we have uh, Doyne Farmer, who's a complexity scientist, so complexity science within those uh, organizations. There's no reason. We just don't care. We only care about war. I mean, look what just happened in Germany. They were fighting, and I'm quite good friends with the Minister of the Economy, Habeck. He's been fighting with the Minister of Finance, who says there's no money. Habeck, who's the Minister of the Economy, was the head of the Green Movement. You know, basically huge fight about budgets, then Ukraine happens and they create 100 billion overnight, right? Which, you know, for good reasons. But why do we only know how to create money for wars? Why do we need to wait for a, a health pandemic to wake up that there's a Defense Production Procurement Act, which came out of the Korean War, which Biden used to procure in, uh, uh, you know, both the vaccines and the PPE. So we know how to do it when millions of people are dying, too little, too late. We know how to do it with war. And by the way, in wartime, the Defense Department works well with the private sector. Why? Because they want to win the war. So even health, and we know that health is one of the most scandalous sectors where you have huge public money, right? But then the, the pharmaceutical industry somehow can set whatever price they want through value-based pricing, not when the Defense Department funds health and soldiers get sick on the battlefield. So there's a whole history of Defense Department's fighting, funding health innovation and not getting screwed basically by big pharma, but working well with big pharma, for example, around intellectual property rights. They make sure that they're not too strong, too wide, too upstream. 
They negotiate. Why? Because they want to win the war. <laughs> Why don't we think about our social problems like that? And I don't like to think about war, but hey, it's, it's interesting. Why? Because we know how to do it. We just decide not to do it with, when it's societal and kind of social issues. Well, you tragically, we may have lots more examples to do it in the face of war, I suspect. But Sorry? We may yet have more examples, yeah. a more initiative to do it in the face of war, I suspect, yeah. tragically. Yeah. But Rosie, did you want to answer the question about opportunity costs? Lost, yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I will just very quickly. I also just wanted to add to something. It's not just about, you know, kind of military spending, right, in, in, in this area. Yeah. We won't kind of, um, you know, hit this home too much. But I was watching the news the other day with my dad, and um, I saw a piece about it in, in the front row. And, and we were watching this piece about how the government, you know, has just, has just um, you know, bought or procured their new nuclear warheads for 2035, right? So governments can plan uh, very long term. Governments can invest in developing capabilities for long-term procurement and the development of these new technologies that are very long-term. I'm also from Bridgewater, where Hinkley Point uh, 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 nuclear power station is biggest construction site in Europe, and that's been um, or what's being built there was now a design from the late 1990s. So governments can do these things; they can do long-term thinking. You know, I would say in the case of both nuclear warheads and the development of Hinkley Point, it hasn't necessarily been a very democratic process, um, but governments can. Um, do do this when they want to. Um, in terms of what is lost, and this and this comes back to it because I think, you know, regardless of um, you know views on on, on military defence spending etc., we can agree that the British government has you know big capacity in this area, right? Um, and in other other um, and part of how that comes to be developed is because it is invested in over time. So this also speaks to your question. You know, I would say that it is precisely in those areas where these challenges will continue to be challenges for decades to come that we need to be investing in developing the capacity now. Because as, as you'll know from, you know, working in organisations yourselves, um, a lot of knowledge in your workplaces uh, is, is tacit. It's not stuff that you can codify. You can't write this down and hand it over to someone else to just do this exactly the same task that you've been doing for the past few years. You have knowledge that you develop tacitly that is not codifiable. And this is how organisations learn. It's not just through, you know, contracting externally. There are also endogenous learning processes. So these opportunity costs, and we talk about this in the book, and it's something I look at a lot in my PhD precisely, and how do we develop capacity in governments for... Um, implementing these very long-term green transition strategies that governments have got, um, they do need to be investing in, in developing that now because they will need to be able to respond and adapt to these challenges as they, unfortunately, continue to, to evolve into the future. Right. Can, can I just add one thing on what is lost? Yeah, sure. Through an example that was given to me by Frances Morris, um, the ex-head of the Tate Modern. Is she in the audience? No? No? Okay. Um, she said that... You know, her objective when she was head of the Tate Modern, she um, stepped down I think, a year and a half ago, uh, was to bring people into the museum that had never walked into a museum before and to showcase artists that had been marginalized from Tate Modern kind of institutions, um, as well as every now and then a blockbuster show to kind of rake in the money. But she said if she followed the incentives that were being provided by the Treasury and the kind of green book kind of, you know, evaluation of public investments, you know, cost-benefit analysis and net present value, she would have just done the blockbuster shows, which kind of depressed her. She was just trying to do those on the side for some money earning opportunities, but she saw her remit as the head of, you know, it's, it's a public institution, um, to do those very bold, you know, two other objectives. And it's really, really hard because all, again, the incentives within government, right, this is government telling the arts uh, community what they're supposed to be doing, bums on seats, ticket sales, was going completely against what one would argue her mission was. So what is lost by having the wrong metrics, you know, bringing in metrics from the private sector into the public sector and the public sector not even knowing how to not just resist that but actually to really rethink <laughs> notions like public value, I really appreciate actually the discussions in the BBC about this. So we've worked very closely with the BBC on redefining public value as you know individual value, social value, uh, industry value. The BBC, by having an internal R and D department, by the way, which is very innovative for a public broadcaster. Most public broadcasters in the world don't have R and D departments. Has been that it has also been able to attract you know, really smart people uh, into the BBC because they see it as an innovative organization. But this idea that there was kind of pushing the frontier, right? Soap operas, 
not just Dallas and Dynasty, but you know, bringing working class people and people that before weren't, you know, in soap operas, kind of, kind of redefining what the soap opera is, which is what EastEnders kind of did, thinking that Dallas and Dynasty was basically the only kind of soap opera before, that pushes the frontier, which ultimately business gets crowded in into that space. Right, similarly with the kind of you know high quality documentaries, um, with bringing women's football you know to the screen and the way that's happened. If you are a market shaper, it's not just about public value. If you do it well, you end up crowding in the private sector. But you need a narrative for that. And instead, what we see is that these organizations, like the BBC, like public banks, like sometimes public museums, are accused of crowding out, you know, crowding out their private sector. But even the fact that the good word is crowding in. It's still crowding, right? So we don't even have a narrative, a story of the good stuff, you know, kind of dynamizing in or catalyzing, creating a really interesting Keynesian multiplier, but with a direction, not just growth for growth's sake. That really requires kind of a reinvention of the underlying theory, but also the stories we tell. And what's lost is, you know, <laughs> in the case of a public museum or in the case of public health sector, the public bit that is for people. Right. Right. I should say, by the way, that I think the makers of Coronation Street might take exception yeah. to thinking that East Enders was first. But anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> just by the way, having grown up with Coronation Street. And we've got a question online. We've got a question from our online audience that's coming from Amy Knight, who asks whether there is anything consumers can do collectively by way of their spending choices to help steer governments towards doing the right thing, e.g. adopting your five-point plan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that they would say, buy the book, yeah. but yes. We had Cornelia. And, okay, we'll take three more, two more then, okay? One over there, yep. And then. And um, we've got a, um, got a... Thank you. So you, you've mentioned both NASA and DARPA as examples of doing something right. And... I think DARPA in particular, they don't actually develop the internet themselves or yeah. do anything themselves. They outsource, they have yeah. a lot of money to give away sure. and they figure out who to give that money to exactly. to make those things happen. And they attract good people by giving them huge power exactly. to give vast sums of money away. I guess I'm worried that NASA and DARPA are not scalable mm. to just normal civil servant type tasks. Mm. How do you... Because it's a different kind of thing. Most civil servants are just, they are doing the work themselves. They don't have money to give away. Mm -hmm. and, and they're often even looking for guidance to how to do their jobs better. But, but I, I guess I want to make that right. distinction and see how you react to it. Yeah. Okay. Point. And one last question. Take the lady there in the front. And then we'll have to, I think, unfortunately, just um, there with the blue, blue, blue scarf. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO of Open UK. The UK is in a very unique moment from a technology perspective where unlike most countries around the world, we fail to put policy and regulation in place around various technologies like AI. Yeah. And in a way that gives us an advantage, a late mover advantage where we could take some risks that would really change the face of the public and private sector in the UK. What one piece of advice would you give a future Prime Minister to make sure that that happens and see that shift and make that risks taking economy exist? So, three, three very big questions. Which of you wants to go first? You want to go first? Yeah, keep going first. Yeah, the, Language, sorry, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, really good questions. Maybe I'll start with um, Dwayne Farmer. So, first of all, I... I don't say, and I would never say, that NASA is a perfect organization. I'd, I'd say that NASA, over time, has actually itself lost its capacity. I, I wrote an article about this back in 2016. You know, low Earth orbit is, you know, like there, there is a real opportunity to rethink the economy in space um, in a way that actually learned from all the lessons on Earth, <laughs> not to repeat the same mistakes like short-term finance. You know, short-term exit-driven venture capital has not helped the biotech sector. Why do we think it's going to help the space sector? But also, if you know, what was interesting with with uh, the Apollo program was that NASA was at a time when it was working well with the private sector exactly doing what you said. I don't say that NASA or DARPA made the investments. They used tools like outcomes-oriented procurement to crowd in innovations in the private sector, but that required huge skill. 
they had to change procurement from cost plus procurement to fixed price outcomes oriented procurement with incentives for innovation and quality improvement in the private sector. Very different from how many health sectors work with private pharma where you know, they do a lot of the investments or procure in solutions but negotiate very badly because there's no clear outcome of what they're trying to achieve. So I would argue a lot of pharmaceutical companies get away with murder in their, literally, because people die, in their relationship with public uh, agencies that aren't as strategic as NASA was with the uh, 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 moon landing. They had contracts for the moon landing that said no excess profits which is basically no rents. If you read Ricardo, Adam Smith, Karl Marx, they actually had a theory of rents, different from profits. Rents are excess profits, excess, depending on, we could go into a theory of rents here, we don't have time. But just the fact that NASA knew its role, had kind of self-worth in working with the private sector, made them have these you know, contracts that were, again, outcomes-oriented, catalyzing huge amounts of innovation in the private sector, and cared about the distributional effect as well. No excess profits. Don't turn this into a gambling machine, basically. So those are the interesting lessons, I think. And there's no reason that we shouldn't have more outcomes orientation in areas like health. Or and just think all all our problems, you know, in water. Think of the global hydrological cycle. I'm currently co-chairing the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. There's huge water problems that require massive amounts of investment in the private sector. But that would then require kind of water agencies, you know, thinking about how to steer you know, plans that then crowd in the private sector to solve those problems, as opposed to just subsidies, guarantees. You know, 80% of industrial wastewater is not recycled. That's crazy. And yet water rights from governments are given to the private sector, Pepsi, all the breweries, right? The water rights are government's rights. They almost right. globally, the water rights are, are national. And yet there's no conditionality to make sure the private sector invests in all those bottom-up solutions that got us to the moon around the water problem. So. That's um, that. Oh my God, my thing is so messy. Yeah. What was the first well, one? Coming, oh, coming from consumers. a city, coming from consumers. a city like Cambridge, which has a lack of water to grow new yeah. housing in, mm. that's a very, very you know potent example. Yeah. Do you want to do the consumer one? Yeah, just very briefly, I was going to say. I mean, th there there are lots of things. I'm, I'm looking at someone, but there's no one there because it was it was uh, online. Um, oh right. Hello online. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So so what can consumers or I guess citizens more broadly do? Um, I think there are a few things. I think you know, first and foremost, we if if we look at this as we have in the book as a fundamental transformation of how the governments and public services are run, then there are all Always ways that people can engage with um, campaigns and with MPs, for example, um, when there are new uh, developments happening at a local hospital or um, all of these things. It's kind of quite tangible things um, that citizens can do. Um, yeah, in, in that respect, uh, yeah, get involved in these. You don't just have to buy the book. Um, you know, we would encourage you to to, to do more. Right. Yeah. Um, maybe the third question, which was on yeah, on what we would tell prime ministers, besides everything we, we, we've already said that we would tell prime ministers, like invest in your civil service. On AI, for example, I think it's interesting how you know, Sunak had this big conference on AI. But AI, you know, like the whole idea of a mission-oriented approach is not to think of the technology, but to always remember that so many technological advances came about not only from basic research, and we should always also invest in basic research, you know, blue sky thinking, but also the kind of applied bit wasn't applied in the sense of like with a commercial end in mind, but applied in the sense that there was a problem to be solved. So the reason we have the internet was that there was a problem to get the satellites to communicate. The reason we have GPS is the Navy needed to know where the ships were. So one of the questions with AI is, first of all, it shouldn't be seen just as a sector to fund in the same way that the pharmaceutical industry shouldn't be seen as a sector to fund through a life sciences strategy, but as a critical sector that, first of all, is increasingly cross-cutting, right? It's like a general purpose technology that would be, in my view, important for any sort of mission, but also that that requires actually having a vision of where are we trying to go? What are the big problems, if you want, that society needs to solve in the UK? And what is the kind of role of AI within that? But also, how do we think of it not just as like tech or science, but think of, for example, what happened recently in Denmark where they had, 
huge investment in renewable energy and they had big companies, right, that national champions like Vestas, but they realized that a really critical aspect of renewable energy was also the digital services around it. So the ecosystem around renewable energy was just as important as the energy itself. And today, Denmark, a tiny country, is the number one provider of high-tech green digital services to China, and China spending you know, trillions on, uh, on trying to reduce the pollution that's being created by a very polluting manufacturing base. So just in terms of your question with the UK, like really thinking through, first of all, where are we trying to go, and how do you not think about just like, oh, we're going to be the best AI you know, capital of the world, but how do we actually create a really dynamic ecosystem around data, around digital services, AI, uh, within that, but for what? Right. And, and I think that idea that Cameron had, but then completely forgot almost right away, of actually making the UK one of the greenest countries in the world, what is the role of tech, what is the role of data, what is the role of digital governance around that, that's actually an area and the services around that that the UK actually could compete in. I don't think, for example, that we'd be the most competitive in electric cars. We'd basically deindustrialize the country. But the service sector, instead of it just being financial services, and 80% of finance in this country goes back to finance, finance, insurance, and real estate. Right. So not only is the climate on fire, finance is on fire. Really rethinking financial services, digital services, uh, AI-related services for a directed economy towards more health and well-being and climate and sustainability. You know, that could be a very interesting niche for this country. Well, let's hope so. We certainly need to find lots of interesting niches right now to this growth. Um, well, listen, we're sadly, we are out of time. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, personally, I sort of take away three key themes. Um, one, consultancy is a bit like a cancer on the body politic in the sense that it keeps spreading inexorably um, and doing tremendous harm. And in some ways, insofar as it's weakening business and weakening government, um, could end up being to the detriment of us all. Um, secondly, that's not anyone's fault. You've made it very clear. You're not pointing your finger at evil consultants or anything like that or indicating there's some kind of secret James Bond master plot <laughs> to try and bring down business and the government. Um, it's really a problem of structure and, above all else, culture and what we are trained to expect from government and from society and what we value and what we attach prestige to and what we don't. Mm. Um, and thirdly, you know, the only way we're going to change this is both by changing structures and by changing culture. There are some quite encouraging examples that you've alluded to, mm. plenty of bad examples. Mm -hmm. um, no one's going to, you know, embrace the Australian approach anytime soon. <laughs> but, you know, there are some encouraging examples to point to. Um, we can't all be Danish, but that's one example of a small country that's managed to turn itself around quite dramatically and make some interesting choices. Singapore is another. I'm sure there are plenty more that we can look to for positive examples. And perhaps what's most clear is that going into the next election, um, we really need to find positive narratives yeah. for change and raise our ambition nationally yeah. to do better in every sense, not just in the private sector, but yeah. government too. Yeah. So I guess I'll conclude by Amazing. saying to you and to the audience, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julian. <laughs>